um, again, uh, I hope that today's session is going to be fun. Uh, before we start going through every um, the concept and the use case and everything, uh, I would like to let you know that if you are interested to follow up and build a project with me uh, uh, while we're uh, working today and explaining machine learning and using uh, the Yaku platform, uh, I would encourage you to go through uh, this website. Uh, it's our Dilipu uh, website, and you can uh, go ahead and launch the uh, free edition uh, that is free for 14 days. Uh, or if you want to download the entire uh, platform on your machine, uh, this is free forever. Uh, but for quicker sessions uh, for today, you're going to be just launching this. You're going to be directed to um, a page that where you are going to be providing your email um, address. And then um, the link and the password will be sent to you uh, in about 10 minutes. Uh, hopefully, this is a time uh, where we can start the hands-on uh, part. So uh, let me just share that screen with you, that um, uh, page with you on the chat. Uh, so go ahead and uh, provide that. And feel free to just sign up. And um, if you don't feel uh, like you want to follow up with uh, building the same um, uh, project, um, it, it's all right. You can uh, just um, watch and enjoy. And we're going to be um, having fun. You can just do the, the exercise later on your own time with the recording and uh, with the time that you have uh, the platform downloaded. Uh, anyway. Um, hey, no, just, I'm just going to stop you for a second. We've got quite a lot of people saying um, that they are unable to use those login details. There's a data IQ internal error when people try and use their LinkedIn. Don, maybe I think it's uh, just this the, the flash at the end. Maybe can you try that? That link? One if second. that works fine. Oh, it's 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 not going well. Okay, so it must be some error with this. So I would highly encourage you to download the free edition. It will take a few minutes if you have like a MacBook, but if not, it will take a while. So don't worry. Uh, just watch and enjoy, and then you can try um um uh, the platform um uh, later uh with the recording uh session I, I i promise you it's going to be so uh easy uh which is good you can ask all the questions that you want uh now i'm sure it was working yesterday was it? not sure why but anyway uh okay so let's start our uh use case uh, today we're going to be talking about the wine uh we hopefully are going to be trying uh, to do some clustering and classification, but don't worry about those uh, terminologies at the moment. Uh, let's just uh, understand what the use case uh, is, and then we can explain uh, machine learning concepts in details and what clustering is and what classification is uh, as well. So um, we have a data set today uh, that is um, about uh, the types of wine. Uh, we have two data sets, uh, one for the white wine and one for the uh, red wine. The data set that we have uh, for the red wine approximately have um, around 16,000 um, uh, rows, uh, while the white wine have um, almost 5,000 uh, rows. The thing the, that you want to know about this is that nothing in the data set that explains that or mentioning that it's a red wine or white wine. So when we take a look at the data set, we will find that it has uh, 12 different properties of uh, the wines, uh, including the quality uh, column as well. So you can see from the screen that we have some variables such as the fixed acidity, uh, volatile acidity, citric acid, and, and so on and so forth, and also the quality uh, of uh, each type of wine, and that's between zero and um, and uh, ten. Uh, we're going to take a look at the data sets, so don't worry about that. But this is just to let you know uh, that this is the type of data set that we uh, what we um, have. Um, from the data sets, we are going to be trying to see if we apply some clustering uh, for uh, the 
um, if we are uh, uh, going to um, uh, apply clustering uh, on the entire data set of both the red uh, wine and the white wine, how does the clustering algorithm define the differences and recognizes uh, the patterns and tell us that we have two types of, of wine in this uh, data set? So we're going to see that. Um, we're going to be also at the end of the uh, session going to be applying some uh, what we call classification and classification basically is to understand what in the data set or what in those features uh, um, um, led to a specific or um, a, a certain level of quality and uh, if we can learn from that pattern and then apply it to predict maybe a future data set uh, that tells us uh, uh, that tells us all those features without the quality. So this will help you later to, to predict the wine uh, quality when you have a data set that doesn't have that uh, column. So um, let's do this. Let's explain the machine learning concepts first. And um, in short, machine learning is about um, um, the, um, um, it's, it's, it's literally coming from an artificial intelligence um, uh, concept. It's a form of artificial intelligence that teaches machines or computers to think uh, in a similar way um, uh, like we human uh, do. So it's like learning from patterns and from past uh, experiences. Um, for example, this is how we think and uh, this is how we make decisions uh, and that is uh, based on patterns and past experiences that we have gone through. So if you're feeling pain when you're touching a hot surface, for example, if you're reading about lions and, and knowing that they can attack you, um, if you're hearing loud noise and seeing car crash at the same time, these are all past experiences that human use to make decisions to, to survive. So you don't touch a hot surface, you don't um, uh, approach or, or, or get closer to lions and, and um, you stop when you see um, the traffic light. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the case. And this is literally how uh, machines or computers um, uh, used to work before uh, the, 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 the machine learning concepts. So um, it, used to be um, long programming hours, uh, thousands of coding lines um, uh, that are supposed to be setting rules and, and, and finally be, be able to, to predict or to make decisions. So before machine learning, it was all about rules such as if, then, and, and else. And based on these inputs um, uh, of these rules, the machines would perform actions uh, and outputs such as uh, maybe a successful access to the system or maybe declining a credit card. But as I said, the idea is to have uh, the machines learning to behave or to, to make decisions like humans. So uh, also to improve the learning over time in an automated fashion. That's the idea of uh, machine learning. So this will happen by not providing the rules. It's actually by providing the data itself, which is the past experiences, and then answering um, 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 uh, and providing these answers as well as inputs. So the, the machine would have the answers as well as the past experiences, and then would be able to look at the patterns and then learn from these, uh, from these rules. So the rules uh, can be uh, symptoms of, of a disease maybe. Uh, that means that the individual is likely going to be sick or not sick. So you already have the data here as well as the result or as well as the, the outcome of, of this data in the first place. And then the rules could also be uh, financial um, and, and personal information, uh, account details maybe, um, uh, and, and patterns and of spending behavior. That means that this client could be qualified for a loan um, or not. Um, the rules can also be uh, um, purchases. That means that um, the customer belongs to a, a segment, a specific segment of customers who might be interested in product A rather than uh, in product B, for example. Rules can also be uh, the past information about the last 12 months of sales figures. Uh, so this might be, um, uh, based on that, this might be the sales figure for our next uh, three months and, and, and so on and so forth. 
So normally when you're talking about machine learning or when someone is talking about machine learning, you will hear those two words, um, the two types of machine learning. Um, it's the uh, supervised and the unsupervised. Um, literally unsupervised means that, um, as you can see from the screen here, the data um, is not labeled. It means that it's just data that doesn't say uh, anything about the idea of that, the outcome that this person is sick or not sick or nothing. It's, it's just data with no label for it. But when we're talking about supervised learning, it means that we are working with a technique that is used for data that has a precise mapping or a precise relationship between the input and um, the output. Um, we can explain that uh, in details, um, but uh, anyway, for our course today and for our session today, we can talk about unsupervised learning uh, and refer to it as the, with the term clustering and the supervised learning, we can refer to it uh, uh, with the term uh, prediction. Um, and let's explore what unsupervised learning is, uh, which is the, the clustering and uh, maybe understand uh, when can we use it uh, in, in various uh, use cases. So um, clustering, Basically, uh, it's about finding patterns. It's like detecting existing groups that have um, a specific level of, of similarity. So this could be a data set of uh, customers or a data set of patients. And clustering techniques is about finding the similarity between those patients uh, and a specific symptom. Uh, maybe the fact that these groups of customers are, um, are living in a, a specific area, they shop at uh, a certain supermarket, uh, maybe they are interested in um, a group of, of products or, or, uh, or, um, uh, or maybe a, a certain interest. So anyway, clustering is, is about finding those segments of, of um, uh, and groups uh, that are similar in, in your data set. Um, the most common um, algorithm. Uh, uh, yeah, and as I said, uh, in, in clustering, we don't have labeled data. It's just data that have so many information about uh, uh, whatever the, the topic or the use case that we are, uh, are working uh, on. It's literally, as you can see from the screen, it's like, if you think about it, it's like um, giving a box of toys uh, and and uh, to a to a child maybe, and the task is to separate similar groups so they can find uh, the cubes and and separate them from uh, the ducks here or the bears or uh, whatever. So it's just about finding uh, similarities and separating those uh, those groups. Um, the most common algorithm uh, in clustering is actually um, k-means. Um, and we are going to be going through k-means in detail so you can understand how it works and how it finds uh, similarities and patterns in the data. And once you understand that, we will be applying this uh, instantly on our, um, our data set uh, today. So um, let's do that. Um, so I think the slides are going a bit either quicker or, or slower than, uh, than my clicks. Uh, as I said, k-means recognizes the shape of, of your data. So if you imagine that this is a two-dimensional data set, x and y, and these are your um, data points, uh, what happened is that uh, based on the user's decision uh, that's me, for example, uh, I decide the number of segments or the number of clusters that I want to recognize in the data set that I have. So maybe I will just communicate with the machine that please find me three groups or six groups uh, that are similar in this uh, data set. So the K is actually referring to the number of clusters that you want to detect or, def uh, or define in uh, in your data set. Uh, K-means um, 
that's the name of the algorithm. And as I said, uh, if we decided that k uh, equals a specific number, such as one, maybe, what happens is k means initiates um, a random point uh, in the data set. And this random point is called a centroid. Uh, the centroid is actually the center of the cluster or that segment of data points that you have. What happens after this point is initiated? It claims the entire data set uh, or the closest, um, the closest data points uh, as part of its, of its cluster. Uh, and that is based basically on the on the what we call the Euclidean distance. So literally, it decides that this is closer than this, this is closer than this. So and it's a direct um, uh, line between A and B. So it claims uh, the closest point as its uh, its own. In this case, in what you see on front of you in the screen, k equals one. So that means the entire uh, cluster is belonging to that random point or our, uh, our, or our uh, centroid. If I decided that I want two segments or two clusters, that means I'm declaring that k equals two. What will happen is that there will be another centroid, also a random point initiated somewhere in the, in the data, and it will start claiming the closest point um, as part of its uh, cluster. Let's try with k equals three. If k equals three, that means three random uh, centroid points are going to be initiated. And each one of them is going to be the claiming the closest uh, data points as a part of its own cluster, which is the start of how the algorithm will behave um, after that. Um, Sorry, you're saying audio. Did I put myself on mute? Okay, good. <laughs> Someone said, um, oh, audio. Um, sorry. Uh, so yeah, um, let's see what happens after that and how the algorithm is behaving after initiating those, uh, those um, centroid. What will happen is that uh, comes the iteration part. K means, that's the algorithm's name, it uh, starts to iterate to adjust its position. Uh, and by adjusting the position of that centroid, this happens by minimizing the sum of squared errors for that distance between each centroid and all the other uh, data points um, of, of each group and each uh, cluster. So it keeps moving, it keeps adjusting uh, its position. Uh, and based on that uh, distance that uh, I've, I've, I've explained, and uh, with every move and with every iteration, you can see that some points are changing and not belonging to one cluster versus, uh, versus the other. So um, it, it keeps just moving until two things could happen. Until the first thing it might happen is that no further movements are available. So the cluster can no longer claim any more uh, data points as its own. Or if the user, that's me, um, uh, building the, the, the model, uh, trying to say that I would want the algorithm to stop after a certain number of, of iterations. So um, either in this case or that case, uh, the iteration stops. And once the iteration has stopped, each centroid now has um, um, settled and claimed uh, the surrounding uh, data points as its own uh, cluster. When this happens, now um, the centroid um, has claimed uh, all these uh, clusters as, um, as its own. And that is based on the average or the mean of the distances uh, that uh, are between that um, uh, centroid and uh, the remaining uh, data points in, in the cluster. 
uh, once this happened, once it's settled, now the clusters are decided and we now have the final segments or the final groups of similar data points in, uh, in our data sets. So in short, this is literally how k-means uh, is working. There are so many other uh, clustering algorithms that you can um, uh, read about, but this is the most common one and the majority of the data scientists would literally start with just uh, throwing their entire data into uh, clustering just to understand the patterns and the, the similarities and then decide what happens later. So um, I, I sometimes just start with clustering my data to see what's going on there before um, going to um, uh, a further, uh, a further um, 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 step. How do you decide the number of clusters? That's a very good question. Um, the number of clusters is, is basically either based on your use case or in some advanced levels, you can apply a technique, but this is a bit um, advanced uh, uh, for the audience today, maybe uh, if you are beginners, uh, we uh, apply something called um, an elbow function. Uh, an elbow function is basically, um, um, is basically about a way uh, to decide the ultimate number or the, 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 the ultimate number for clusters in your data. So you apply this function first, it recognizes or it tries to apply um, um, k-means with number of k's until it finds the, uh, the correct one or the, the, the most accurate one and then provides you uh, with that. And then you provide that number uh, when you're building the model and, um, and decide that, yeah, I want to find the eight segments or the eight clusters in my data based on my uh, elbow function. Uh, you can read about that, uh, but uh, let's see first how we can apply clustering uh, in data pool. And um, uh, hopefully later you will be able to download the free edition or um, launch the, the, the cloud uh, space um, uh, trial and uh, and apply um, uh, the the steps yourself. So let's do that. Um, if you have DSS or if you've managed to install it uh, and you have um, this is the home page that you're starting with. Um, let me just uh, go through uh, the platform briefly. This is the home page for the. Um, for the platform. Uh, it's empty right now because this is um, 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 an instance or an environment dedicated for this session. Uh, but if you are going to be um, having this uh, as part of your daily job, it will be uh, similar to this one. This is our own environment at Dideku and these are the projects that I have or uh, someone else in my team has built and and shared with me. So soon you will have uh, more projects appearing here. What I will um, do is I will start a new project and it's going to be a blank project. I'm gonna name this clustering uh, uh, or classification for wine maybe. Let's just name it that. And then I'm gonna create the project. And we have a few concepts in DSS, uh, that's our product name, Data Science Studio, that you need to be aware of. The first concept is what we call the project. And this is the home page of your uh, use case or your business question. So you can see here that this is a new project. That means I have zero data sets. I haven't started with anything. Uh, I don't have any transformation steps. I haven't built any notebooks. But there is one blank dashboard that has been built uh, uh, for me that I can apply, um, um, uh, that can, I can add uh, insights to it once I build uh, one. So I'm going to import my first data set. And here is a fun part just for all of you and all of your information here. If you uh, click on import your first data set, you will be taken to this page which is going to be different every time you're working with a different environment. So for example, some of you might be having uh, DSS uh, installed and connected to a SQL 
uh, database. Some of you might be connected to a Hadoop cluster. Some of you might be just working with CSV files or maybe connected to Amazon S3 or whatever. So um, for me here, we can connect uh, my, my, my data set to uh, uh, a Postgres maybe, or uh, just work on it on the file system that we have. But uploading the data is, is very easy. Uh, the data that I have is a Wine data set that's a CSV file. And uh, if you guys would like, if any of you has the platform, I have the link for the data set here as well. I will share it with you. So you can download that. Uh, and you can either build it now or uh, later when you have the platform uh, to play around with. But anyway, uh, let me first upload uh, the file and it's very easy, it's a drag and drop. Uh, so this is uh, the CSV file, I'm dragging it and dropping it here. However, this is a spreadsheet, so I need to check a few things first. So before saying okay, I'm gonna preview the, the, the data set. And I can see here that it has multiple sheets. So there is a sheet for white wine and uh, a sheet for uh, red wine. So what I will do is I will upload each one separately. The reason for that is I want to look at them separately first and then maybe um, combine them together and then apply clustering just to see if the k-means of the clustering is going to be uh, working as expected or not. So uh, I will first start with the white wine and I can see here the uh, data, how it looks like. These are the, um, these are the, uh, um, the variables that I have as we've explained from the, the use case. And I will just name my data here, uh, white wine. And I'm gonna go ahead and create that. And I'm instantly taken to the view of the data set. And I can see here that I have the number of rows and how many columns. And what you can see in front of you here is the tabular view of your uh, data set. This is so cool because it's telling you a lot of things. Um, it's um, telling you um, how many variables do you have? And also there are two different types of schemas. Yes, we can show that last step again, of course. Um, but wait for me first uh, before, um, before I do that. So once you have access to the data set, you will see here that you have two types of, um, of, uh, of the data set, one in gray and one in blue. So the gray one, as you can see, it's um, a string. The reason for that is when we uh, uploaded the data set from, uh, from here from the desktop, this was a CSV file and all the, the variables were uh, uh, assigned a type of, of a string. So this is the original schema of your uh, data set. Uh, DSS or Data Science Studio is declaring it as it is. However, it's normally providing a meaning uh, it's like somehow saying that, yeah, I can see that you've submitted this column as a string, but I can detect that it's a decimal. And this is my business interpretation or business meaning for it. So this is D DSS's way of, of helping you to recognize what is, uh, what is going on on your data. So yeah, let me repeat that step again, uh, but let's go to what we call the flow first. Uh, from here, and the flow is basically the visual representation of what happens in your project. So you will upload the data sets here, and then you will start building um, recipes and applying steps uh, that will transform your data from one uh, version to um, another. So let me just delete this. I will repeat that step again. I'm gonna import my first data set. I'm gonna upload my file and I am going to um, drag and drop here and I'll review 
And then I will upload just the first sheet for now and I'm gonna call it white. And I'm gonna create, and this is my data set. I will go to the flow again because I need to upload the second data set, which is the red wine. So I'm gonna go to data set, I'm gonna upload a file again. And it's the same file because I want the next sheet. And I'm gonna preview here. And then I'm gonna unclick this and click that. And I'm gonna call this one red. Now, the reason why I didn't click the two of them and instantly created it is that it will automatically stack all of them as one data set. So it will upload them as just one. But for the first set, I want to see each one separately. So this is why I'm uh, uploading them separately. So I'm gonna create here. And yes, I can see that this is the red wine sheet and it has uh, um, uh, uh, 1599 rows, uh, 12 columns, and uh, these are the information that I have. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, none of the two data sets are referring to the type except for the name. We just know it because the name of the sheet said red and white, but nothing here. There are no columns that says red or, or white. So let's go back to the flow. And this is what the flow looks like. So now I have two data sets. And every time you're looking at the flow, any square um, icons uh, in blue are uh, going to be a representation for a data set. But anything else that you will see is going to be a representation for uh, um, a recipe or transformation step. So if I show you one of the projects here, maybe something like that. If I go to this flow, you will see here that there are a number of blue squares. These are all data sets and anything in a different color in a circle uh, that is either orange, um, yellow or red or sometimes the green ones. These are what we call the recipes and recipes are a transformation steps. So for example, this is a recipe that is used to clean a data set and we call it the prepare recipe. If you open that, you will see here all the steps that I have applied to clean a, uh, a data set. And once I run this, all the cleaning steps have been applied on the data. So that's literally what we are going to be doing today. So let's go ahead and uh, apply the first step, which is basically uh, I'll stack these two data sets together to have one file or one data set that maybe we can apply clustering on. So note with me that once I'm clicking on just one data set, what will happen is that all recipes uh, can be available for me to uh, apply. So I have here what we call visual recipes. These are recipes that if you understand what you want to do to your data, you don't need to code for it. So all you need to do is to just uh, decide certain parameters and then run it and then the recipe uh, will run and apply what you want uh, to your data set. Um, coding recipes, if you want to still um, use your coding skills, you can still um, uh, pick any of them based on your infrastructure. So for example, because right now these data sets are stored on the file system, I can only use Python or R or any of those orange active ones here. But if I have one of these data sets stored on a maybe SQL uh, database, I will have SQL active. If I have it stored on HDFS Hadoop, I will have Hive, Hig, and Impala uh, um, uh, active for me to feed. So let's do this. Um, as you can see, one data set, I have everything available for me. But if I select the two of them, like if you click shift on your, uh, on your keyboard, if you type shift and select these two, 
you will see here that only the two um, um, relevant recipes are available for you. The reason for this is that these are two data sets that you selected. You can either apply join or stacking um, to them. In this case, I want to apply stacking because I want to have them both in just one uh, data set. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to just call it wine, the whole wine data. And every time you're initiating a recipe, you have, um, you have three things to decide. Uh, the input, uh, which we've decided is going to be the first data set, second data set, and then the name of the new uh, output. And where do you want to store this? Um, I have connected. Um, how can you get DSS? Is it free? You can have the free edition from uh, the, the website. Uh, yes, it will be installed on your uh, local machine. Uh, or if you initiate the free trial, it will be a web-based. Um, so, okay, let's do this. The wine, uh, the file system managed. Uh, I can continue storing the data set in the file system managed. That means on, on, on my machine, or I can move it to a database that I am connected to. If I move it to Postgres, this is a database that I've connected it to the platform. So I'm gonna add this and change it. And then I will go ahead and create the recipe. And once I've created the recipe, now I'm inside the recipe and now I can see what is going on. So let's see how DSS is helping us when uh, we're trying to stack. Uh, you can tell here that the white wine, red wine data set, this one is, uh, has, a, has a blue circle, this one has a green circle. And this is somehow DSS is telling you that, yes, I can detect that there is a column called fixed acidity in red and in white and so on and so forth toward the rest of the uh, variables. Uh, but this is because it's a very nice data set, uh, very clean, I've already cleaned it for you guys, but sometimes you might have different uh, names for the variables. So if you have fixed acidity in white wine in uh, uppercase, but in red wine, it's in lowercase, it will not be uh, mapped as um, equal. In this case, you can, check from the column selection and use what we call the manually remapping because in the manual remapping, you can name the columns whatever you want and you can map manually which column is equivalent to uh, which one. So in our case, we don't need to do this because it's a, it's a very nice two data sets and we can just go ahead and uh, run it. And we will see what will happen now. There is a simple rule in DSS, which is the green and uh, red. So green means it's, um, it's cool, it's, it's, it's done, it's perfect. Uh, no errors, nothing is, is wrong. However, if this bar is red, that means there's something wrong and you need to start looking at it and, and uh, fix it. So I'm gonna go back to the flow now to see what the flow looks like. And here is how the flow looks like. And you can tell from the icons where the data set is stored. What you see in front of you is actually a pointer to where this table is stored. And you can see here that this is an icon for Postgres. That means this data set is stored on Postgres but these are our file system. And I'm gonna show you here how other icons related to other data sets look like. So if it's HDFS, it's gonna look like this tiny elephant. If other uh, SQL databases, it's, these are the icons related to that. Um, if it's a cloud, so this is what an Amazon S3, this is what Azure blog and, and Google and, and Twitter look like. And uh, this is what uh, NoSQL look like, and so on and so forth. So um, this is the idea. So um, if we um, 
if we go back to what we were trying to do here, we were trying to apply clustering um, using k-means because we wanted to detect the patterns and to understand how many segments or how many clusters in our data. Because we already know, because in our use case, this is for demonstration, I already know that there was white wine and red wine, and I know that this is a cluster and this is a cluster, but now, this entire data set, I mean, if I go to details here and I can compute the number of records, now this entire data set has two clusters. But let's see if K means will recognize these clusters or not. So if we recall, this one had um, around. Um, 4,898, and this one uh, had 1,599 rows, okay? So let's see if, if k-means will recognize it, that there are two clusters or two segments in this data set. The way to access machine learning in DSS is very easy, and you can do this without any coding. So what we will do is that we will uh, click on the data set that we want to cluster. And then we are going to go to the lab. The lab is where you access machine learning capabilities. So let's go to the lab. And you have two options here. You can either go ahead and code or you can apply a quick model. If you choose new, that means you need to build your own model from the scratch. But these are ready and built-in models built for you to just apply. You will still see the code behind the scene. Nothing is a black box operation in DSS. So let's go for quick model. And we are trying now, the task is to do the clustering. Um, you can choose a um, quick model or expert model, but this you're going to be amending and changing. This one is the ready built uh, model for you. So let's go for the quick model. And you can see here that the first thing is K means. That's what I want to apply. I'm going to create that. And before training, I'm going to be designing. Uh, just to check what is happening here. So feature handling means that do you want to include all the features you have or not? I would like to include all of them, so no problem. Uh, the algorithms, you can choose all of them, two or three of them, or just simply the k-means that we want. And uh, dimensionality reduction is when you have a huge data set of so many uh, rows and so many columns and you want to just compress it in order to run something on it and so on and so forth. Um, there is an entire course in machine learning and how to uh, explaining um, every little thing of these on our academy. I will share the, 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 the links later. But let me just change this here because I don't want to have uh, five segments or five clusters. I just want the two. I just want to see if K means is going to be recognizing the two clusters I have in my data set uh, or not, because this is me deciding that K equals two. And if I go ahead and save this and I'm going to train it, I will call this K means file one example and after this we're going to take questions and i will train and i can instantly see here the model running and being trained to detect the clusters first cluster second cluster let's look at how they look and how many records in uh in each of them so if i click on this one you can see here that the first cluster very very close to the number we had for uh, the the red wine uh, data set which is 1599 and this one is almost very very close there were no outliers outliers means um, data points that are very far from this cluster and that cluster and detected as 
uh, outliers. Uh, so yeah, it looks like yes, K-means has recognized based on the features that we have that there is a cluster or there are data points that are similar in these features and more. And another group of data that are similar uh, to these ones um, as well. If you are happy with this, and of course you can see what the variable importance are, which tells you that the most important variables that decided that this data point belongs to that cluster or this cluster were um, these um, in, in order. So if you're happy with this, you can deploy that uh, model. You have two choices. You can create it an individual one, which means that every time you're receiving a wine data set, you can um, uh, apply it uh, on it, apply that model on it to give you the clusters, or you can uh, just uh, uh, create um, the, the, the recipe uh, for that specific data set uh, that we have. Either choices are, are good. We we're, we're, we're fair to, to take any of them. Uh, but I'm happy to um, just um, get this one done here and apply it on my uh, data set, Y, and then create it. So now you can see that this uh, is the data set, and this one is the one uh, that uh, is going to be clustered based on the names of, of the clusters that we have. So let's see what happens. Here you can see the cluster labels, which is identifying each one uh, as which cluster it does belong uh, to. Let's analyze this to see how many of them. So if we analyze that, we will see that this is the number of data sets for cluster one, and this is the number of data sets for cluster uh, two. So yeah, this is literally what we've done with clustering. I'm happy to take questions now, and then we can take a break, and then uh, go to the um, uh, classification after the break. So maybe we can cover a few questions now. That's great, Noah. So in terms of the questions, if you click on the uh, Q&A feature down the bottom, there's 10 uh, that have come in at the moment. Um, if you pick the ones that you think are most relevant and uh, read those out and answer them, uh, we'll mark them as answered as you go. Okay, let me do that. Okay. I see so many people answered their own questions and giving comments, but let me see the this one. Oh yeah so uh, um, a question from Thomas uh, Richardson uh, or actually Thomas is, is answering a uh, question about pH as a categorical variable if so it, it is has an issue. Yeah does previous table indicate we could have got rid of yes we could get rid of any uh, feature that you you want and um, i think if we open this one let me just show you if we open the the model itself the reason for excluding this uh the ph uh in the model here the reason it excluded it in the first place is because I think one of the, the, the records um, had a typo. It wasn't recognized as, um, as a decimal. Uh, it had like a typo, it had a null value or something. Let me just show you. So here. Yeah, so this tab here, this bar here is showing us um, the data quality issues that we might have. So you can see that part of the, the column is red and part of it is gray. Gray indicates that it's empty value. So if I if if we have um, if we filter on this, you can filter either on the non-okay or the empty. Let's 
filter the none. Okay, yes. So some of the variables here were had typos in it. So you can see that this is not 3.11, it's 3.ll. And this one is uh, 3.2L or I, something like that. What you can do to fix this is that you can use the prep recipe to change that. So you can go ahead and um, uh, clean first and then apply maybe find and replace here and choose which column you want to have, such as this one, and then change those values uh, here and then run the recipe and then run um, the, 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 the model um, again. Um, sorry, I have so many other questions. So we need to, yeah. Is the recipe for cleaning the data set automatic or is it pre-written? So the recipe for the prep, you can use the guidance here because it does have uh, suggestions based on the values that you have in each column. However, it's full of processors. So you have here more than 90 processors that are categorized on the uh, left-hand side here. And literally, just if you go through them, there is definitely something that you will be using. So you can copy column, you can transform string, you can do formula, you can do some geography like uh, creating geo point from latitude, longitude, extracting it from geo point, or even resolve an IP. You have uh, things related to um, uh, natural language and it's all built in the back. There's uh, information about each and every processor here that you can use and how it's built and what it's, it's doing. All you need to do is just to decide the parameters for applying that processor. As I said, if it's find and replace, it's built there. You just need to decide which column you want to do find and replace and what is the variable you want to replace it with what, and then add that, and then uh, it will be run once you um, hit run for uh, the recipe. Uh, the term recipe is an exclusive for DSS or is generic machine learning? No, it's, it's a DSS term. Um, it's how our platform is built. Uh, we tried to build it in a very fun, uh, with a very nice uh, user interface way. Recipe is coming from the cooking expression, which is literally about a group of steps that will help you to create a dish. So each recipe is full of steps. You design the steps that you want and then click run, and then you have the new data set created with those uh, information. What is the data upload size limitation and how fast it can upload? This is going to be um, related to what we call the smart computation. So as I said, the data sets that you here have in the file system, these are limited with the file system memory that you have, the machine that you have it on. So for example, I have data pool or DSS installed on my machine, that means this will be using the memory of my machine. But if I am uh, working or having DSS installed on um, a Linux server sits on top of uh, the, uh, the database that I have, that means all the computations are going to be happening in the database, not in uh, um, uh, my machine. Um, just to help you understand, DSS is installed wherever your database is. There's a Linux server that sits on top of it. And uh, this is how it's helping you to connect to it. And this is what it helps you to uh, give information of running certain recipes uh, that will be applied. And it, uh, it leverages the database engine. So nothing is happening with your own uh, uh, machine, nothing is, is happening in our premises, for example, it's all on your premises, whether it's your MacBook or your um, 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 Lenovo or Dell, or whether it's your um, 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 Postgres database or HDFS uh, or Hadoop cluster. Um, how is different from prediction on red or what line? We haven't yet covered prediction. Prediction is going to be covered uh, in the next session. Can you load the streaming uh, data? Yes, you can. I would uh, share some resources that you can get more information about that uh, from the Academy. There are entire courses for this. Can the data set still be stacked if one is missing a column? Yes, it can, because you need to go uh, through the manually uh, mapping them. 
and you can just ignore. So what will happen is that it will appear as a new column here on the side. And if, if the value exists in the first data set, it will be there, but if it's not, it will be empty. So um, that's it. Is it possible to version control recipes? Yes, definitely. If for each and every uh, project that you have, we have here uh, version control, hold on. Version control is, is allowing you to compare the last editions of each uh, step of your project and you can compare two of them and you can also um, uh, revert to one. So let's say, for example, that I don't want the last step or this one, I just want to start from here. So I can uh, click on this one and I can revert to this uh, revision or revert to this change only and so on. So yeah, it's, it's our own GitHub uh, feature in, in DSS. Does DSS quick model function automatically scales the data for running? Yes, it does. Um, I would encourage you to look at the course, the machine learning uh, certification part, the ML uh, practitioner on our academy, because it shows in details how um, you can do that. What parameters do you consider? Um, it, it depends on which recipes you're running uh, and also depends on your use case. What do you want to achieve? Um, how do we save the model to be added to the flow? The model have been added to the flow. The minute you, 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 you click deploy, it has been saved and added to the flow. And I will show this in details with the next uh, uh, prediction um, 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 exercise. Also, is it possible to flatten nested CSV? Yes. Uh, I will, I can show this again, like if I go to the uh, homepage and if I have just a new project, uh, like test, I will show this, but you can, uh, like for example, if I go and import the first data set here and do this, you have here so many options that you need to um, to, to, to change. So you have the files here and you can, you can change. You have the file format and you can choose from uh, these options. So it could be not um, Excel, could be any other um, uh, options here. And then you can uh, change so many uh, features here. You can change the schema, you can uh, control partitioning, or you can do some advanced stuff uh, related to each and every uh, file. Uh, can we see backend code of the model? Definitely, yes. Let me show you quickly um, because after that, we are going to be taking, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes break. I mean, uh, you guys tell us, but if I show you here, this is the model that I have. You can just go to the model. If you want to see the code behind the scene, go to k-means here. And from that, I can, Next to deploy, you can take this to export to notebook. And instantly you will have the notebook with the entire code behind the scene. And it's ready for you to run and amend and change. And then once you change this, you can add that new code as uh, you can transform it into a recipe or you can add this entire code to um, uh, another design and run more trials with k-means and your own uh, code as well. Uh, so it seems as if we need a powerful machine to use DSS, depends on the size of your, of your data. GPU is um, necessary if you're, if you're doing deep learning uh, or, or running image classification and stuff like that. But uh, no, you don't need a powerful machine as per se, because it will leverage the database uh, engine wherever the database is. So yeah, it's like driving a car, like enhancing the, the, the engine doesn't mean that uh, this will affect your driving skills. Where can I see the misclassification? Uh, we did not do classification yet. We're going to be doing classification in after the break. So uh we uh we will cover that you mean the errors yeah uh i'm not sure do we guys have have time for more questions or should we just take a break and then move to the classification because i'm conscious of the of the time 
Uh, yeah, it could be a good idea to take a break. You, you've done well there, F fired through a lot of questions in a short time frame. So maybe a sh short break and crack on to the second part. Okay, when shall we come back? Uh, 2.15 or? Uh, I'll maybe just say five minutes, if, if that's okay. So maybe like 10, 10 past. Yeah, perfect. 10 past, okay. okay. Lovely.
Hey everyone, I am back and I think we can continue with uh, classification now. And after classification, we're going to take more questions um, as well. So um, let me just keep going. Okay classification or prediction. If you recall what we said that there are two types of machine learning, the supervised and the unsupervised, and the unsupervised is the clustering because we don't know what's in the data. So it's just us trying to have the, uh, the algorithm um, detecting the, the, the patterns and so on and so forth. Uh, but the supervised learning, we know what we're looking for. So picture this as a closed box. I don't know what's in it versus a box of items that I know and I have a label for. So um, the idea is that prediction uh, uh, or uh, supervised learning, it simply means that we are kind of utilizing some training data to understand how a specific input variable relates to the class or the, or the label. So when a classifier is trained uh, properly, it understands the relationship between the variable or a set of variables and the output or uh, the label. But prediction is not just about predicting a class or a category. So we can use prediction to predict a distinct value, value or a continuous uh, value. For example, if you want to understand how the number of sleep hours and, and studying hours, uh, uh, these are the predictors, uh, and how will they decide the student uh, will fail or uh, succeed, for example. This is called classification because we have a class as an output, success or failure, sick or not sick, fraud or not fraud. So this is a class or a category. But if we are predicting the score of the test, this is a regression uh, problem. So because we're trying to predict a number here. Before we try DSS to build the project, let's talk about some important concepts that will make sense if you're talking about classification, okay? So the first concept we're gonna be talking about is the train and test concept. As I've just explained in prediction, we are trying to understand the relationship between the input variables, x1, x2, x3, which is, as you can see from the screen here, it's the age, gender, whether the person is smoking or not, uh, having a vaccine or not, and, and so on and so forth. And how is this affecting the output variable or what we call the target? We normally refer to it as uh, y. The train test concept is used to help the, the model to, to test that understanding. And that this is literally how it works. In this example, or in our previous example, we had uh, we have the input variables, um, number of, of studying um, hours, and the number of uh, previous um, uh, uh, sleeping uh, hours, okay, Pre that, that, the, that the student has um, had before the exam. And then we have the target variable uh, y. Train and test concept splits the data that we already know, the, the label for it, into a train set and test set. In machine learning, normally it's 80% versus 20%. And then the machine learning algorithm uses the train set to understand the relationship between input variables and that out label, output label. It keeps just looking and trying to understand. And then once the model is trained to understand the relationship and how these input variables are deciding the output variable or output label, the test set is now used to test the, uh, that understanding. So bear in mind that we already know the output here. We've, we're just hiding it from the machine learning algorithm, okay? So the Y is hidden from the model, and now the model is applying that understanding to predict the possible 
output variable. And then when we are comparing the results uh, uh, of the predicted variable and the actual uh, variable, sorry, it went too, uh, went too quickly. Um, this, is, this is what the machine learning has guessed that uh, based on my understanding for these training sets, I think that uh, a student who studied for five hours uh, and slept for seven hours will likely succeed and so on and so forth. And then once this happened, now we can reveal the true uh, or the actual results and then compare if the machine learning has guessed successfully um, or not. When um, comparing the results of the predicted variable and the actual variable, we get something called the confusion matrix. Um, the values that were correctly predicted versus the value that were incorrectly predicted. This is what confusion matrix is about. So we get this, we get literally uh, the true positive, that's the first thing that we um, have, uh, uh, which means that the value is positive and was predicted as uh, positive. And then we have the true negative, that's the value that was negative and predicted as negative. So these are true predictions. And now the false predictions. False predictions are positive and negative. The positive ones are the values that were negative but predicted as positive. Think about this as someone who was um, uh, sick but uh, predicted as healthy. Uh, and also the false negative, which is the value that was originally or actually positive but was predicted as negative. Why is this important? Because this is a good indication for how your model is doing. So is one of the matrices, if one of the matrices used to, it's, it's actually used to evaluate the performance of the machine learning model, because from the screen that you can see, um, a higher number of true positives and true negatives, these are the actual uh, and were predicted correctly. This is an indication for a good uh, model. But if you have the opposite, that means you need to work on your model and you need to train it again and uh, improve it and uh, uh, enrich the variables that you have until you reach a uh, good number. So that's the first concept. The second concept in classification or prediction is actually called the k-fold cross-validation. This simply means that if you um, if you recall, what we have here um, is um, a data variables and the, 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 predict, the, the labels that we have. So uh, when we're training the data, the concept of the k-fold cross-validation is referring to dividing the, the data set, the, the known data set, into k sets. k also refer to a number. So then um, it's performing the training for the model based on shuffling these sets uh, of, of, uh, of uh, divisions of the data. So for example, if k equals three, for example, this means that we will be dividing the training set into three sets. And then we will train the model with iterations. So the, for the first iteration, what will happen is part one and two will be um, uh, the training set and part three will be the test set. For the second iteration, um, it will be one and three as the training set and two will be the uh, test. And then the last iteration, for example, for the K equals three will mean that two and three will be the training set and part one will be the test set. Why are we doing this? It's because this is a very good way of providing the model with as as many records as possible in order to guarantee that each part of the data set has been once treated as a training uh, set and once as a test set. This is a good enhancing for training the model. This is uh, helping the model to understand more and more uh, patterns and relationship between the input variables and uh, the output variable. Eventually, after the, 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 all the iterations, you get the score of each iteration and you get the average of all um, these uh, scores. And this is how it's calculating the performance of 
um, of the model. Um, so this, these are some concepts that you need to understand how the classification is handling or, or, or doing the, the, um, the, 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 our understanding the patterns. Now let's speak about the, um, some of the algorithms that we uh, might have. I'm not sure we're going to be using, I don't think we have time to, to cover regression, but this, I think we can cover, um, I think we can cover logistic regression first, and then maybe decision tree and render forest. Sorry, guys. Uh, the entire course that I build is also available on the on the academy, so you can just go ahead and 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 uh, and uh, and check that course, and then build uh, the the project um, afterwards. But let's cover decision tree. Um, it's one of the most common algorithms that you will hear about. It doesn't mean that it's the best algorithm that you have for um, classification. Uh, but it's the easiest one to explain to a stakeholder who is not coming uh, from a business, um, a statistics or mathematics background, someone from a business background who needs to make a decision. Um, um, it's a very intuitive, uh, um, um, it's a very intuitive algorithm to, to explain and easy to explain actually. So decision tree um, is basically, um, it, it partitions the data based on um, either or questions. So it starts with an output input variable and based on the answers, it moves to the next variable and ask um, other questions. So. Let's apply this to our student example and see how the decision tree will learn from uh, the data. And these are our students um, uh, with more variables that have been added, such as whether the student have been uh, having healthy diet or not, and which group study they have uh, they were a part of. Now, the, the machine learning model uh, will try to understand the relationship between those variables. Uh, the hours of study, uh, the diet, the study group, and the target variable, um, the, the result, success or, or failure. Decision tree is an upside down tree. So the root starts at the top. The root and the branches are simply a yes and no based questions. They use the variables uh, that we have in the data set and then examine how it leads to a result, uh, which is the target variable. So let's see for the first student, uh, maybe what, uh, what will happen here. So you can see here that for each student, we've taken a variable and then we've decided that uh, how, um, uh, how each question is going to be, uh, to be split. So here, for example, the, for the first uh, question, uh, the tree will start with one of the variables, the hours of the study, and based on the answer, um, which was no in this case, the tree will create another branch with another variable, which is the hours of sleep. And then also based on the, the answer, the tree will create another branch will, with another variable, healthy diet or not, and then based on that uh, answer, this is what will happen and so on and so forth until it reaches the, um, the, the result, which was success. So this is how the decision tree has been splitting the variables. And now the model has reached a specific conclusion. So you can see here that the machine has learned something. It has learned that students who study no less than uh, five hours, sleep no less than five hours, eat healthy diet and are part of group C, these people are likely going to be succeeding. And then after the model has been trained using all the records of the, the training set, the model now needs to be tested uh, with uh, a good performance um, and uh, reliable results. So it's now going to be testing this uh, knowledge. So it has guessed this as success and actually the actual result or the actual label was a success. So that means it's a good model and has been uh, providing uh, good understanding and can be applied on new data sets. 
So this takes us to another important concept, which is called the variable importance. And this will be very, very helpful for you if you're trying to apply machine learning and uh, to, to investigate a root cause for problems or specific uh, patterns that happens in the data set. So let's say, for example, that you were investigating why a customer or why customers are churning or why customers are uh, buying a specific product versus the other one or why um, people are banking at a specific branch, but another branch, um, they, they don't just go. So with the predictions, you get something called the variable importance, which will help you to understand that the main reason behind using this product more or visiting that branch more or getting sick more than other people is basically because of those uh, specific features. How does this work? Um, there is something called impurity um, uh, um, in decrease and variable importance. It's You can think about it as um pruning uh pruning the the tree so it's a technique uh, in machine learning that reduces the size of the decision tree branches because it's removing sections of the tree and that might be providing little power to classify a record so uh, it's explained like that it's decided by the change in the accuracy of the model after removing a branch of a specific variable from the tree. So this is the tree that we've looked at before. For example, if we to remove the branch healthy food, how will this affect the accuracy and the performance of the model? It looks like when we have done that, um, now the machine has predicted this student as fail, but the actual result was that this student was, sorry, it's a bit slow, it's not moving, hold on. But the actual result was that it, the student has succeeded, not, not failed. So it looks like when we removed that variable, um, uh, we, we had an effect on the performance of our model. So it looks like healthy diet is an important variable. So this is what happened when we removed a branch with a specific variable, the accuracy of the model has decreased. So once this happened, this is an indication for you that this variable is important and it shouldn't be removed from the, uh, the decision tree. Once this happened, once you have tested it with removing a number of branches and see how it's affecting on the, uh, the uh, model um, accuracy, what will happen is that all those um, variables will be um, um, ordered uh, by how much effect they had on the accuracy of the model. And you will be provided with um, this uh, uh, graph, which is the variable uh, importance. And this will tell you literally that the most important variable was hours of study because when we removed this from the, uh, uh, the the tree or when we removed the branch of these questions from the tree, it had the highest effect on the accuracy of the model, followed by the hours of sleep, followed by brute study, followed by healthy diet, and so on and so forth. So that's decision tree. There is another famous algorithm called the random forest, and it's a, another variation of decision or of, of tree-based algorithms. It's very, very simple uh, and very, very uh, similar to decision tree, but it's from the name, you can tell that it's a forest. That means it's, it's many trees, okay? Um, and uh, the word random is referring to the fact that each tree uh, is uh, starting with a different variable. So for this tree, for example, it will start with the uh, hours of study, but the second tree uh, in the random forest will start with the hours of sleep and then so on and so forth. So each and every tree in the random forest will start with a different variable. So this is why the name random forest. Each tree will be pruned as well. So that means we will be having each tree giving us its own variable importance. 
and each tree will give a vote for the most important variables it had. And these votes will be um, calculated and collected. And eventually we will be having a more powerful um, uh, variable importance graph that will help you to understand that, yeah, the most important thing that decided if the student will, will succeed or fail is the hours of study followed by sleep, followed by which group study they were part of, uh, of and uh, if they had healthy diet or not. So let's try this on DSS and then we can take some questions. Um, now we are going to be applying classification on the WINE data set. And here we are trying to predict the quality. So we have here the quality of the data set. These are, um, this is the number of records for each quality. So you can see that the most uh, quality we have is six followed by five, seven. So the idea is that we're gonna be applying uh, classification here to decide if the output uh, or if we have uh, variables uh, such as this, this, will it likely be a good wine versus a bad wine? You can apply a previous step to this. Maybe we can divide these into high, medium, low if you want to predict it as categorical, uh, uh, sorry, as, as just three categories. Or you can apply this to be treating these as uh, categorical rather than integers. Uh, and that's what we're going to do because this is classification. Okay, so um, let's do this. Uh, we're going to be using this data set and then we're going to be accessing the lab as well. And we already have the clustering model built. Let's build another one. Quick model here. And this time we're choosing prediction because we're trying to predict the wine quality. And here we need to select the target variable, which is the wine quality here. That's the one that we want the model to look at the patterns that decided that and the relationship between input variable and the label uh, we have. And then let's go for automated machine learning. These will all lead to the same page eventually, but each choice here will, will select a few um, algorithms based on the level of expertise and the level of complication that you have. Let's go with quick prototype and create, and then let's go for design here. So it has recognized this as a re regression because we're trying to predict a quality and the quality has been added as an integer. But the truth is we want to, to treat it as a multi-class classification, okay? So I'm gonna change that and then it will be re um, uh, detecting the setting. And then now it has uh, uh, treated the, the quality as categorical variable rather than numerical uh, variable. Uh, so train and test, you can see here that the train ratio is, um, is 80%, which is fine. Uh, the metrics I want to have, um, you can, if you're, these are all explained thoroughly on, on our course on the academy, so I'd, I'd highly encourage you to go and, and look for which one do they mean, but AFC is fine to, to deal with it. I'll explain that later when we train the model. But let's go for feature handling and see what will happen here. I'm happy to include all of them as predictors in order to help us uh, understand uh, what will lead to specific quality. But let's just explore one of them to see what you can do when you have um, a specific um, uh, a, a variable. Uh, because you can see here what happens behind the scene and you can see here how many choices and parameters that you can set uh, by the help of, uh, of DSS. So you can see here that you can handle missing values by different choices here. You can impute with the different methodologies. You can uh, change how a variable is treated. Uh, so for example, if it's treated as a, um, um, a numerical, you can change this to be categorical and so on and so forth. So um, let's go to algorithms. Um, 
we've already explained decision tree and random force. So maybe we don't want that and we can try that. You can literally try all of them and see the best result. And you can, as I said, add your own custom uh, Python model. Just be sure that it needs to be scikit-learn um, based uh, because the library behind the machine learning here is scikit-learn. That's an open source uh, Python library and you can um, add any of your own algorithms as long as it's supported by uh, scikit-learn. So, and also DSS is helping you by providing you with code samples here that will help you to apply your own, uh, your own model. Um, I think that would be okay for now because yes, we can just go ahead and train the model. And then let's call this classification trial, trial, sorry, trial one and see what's going to happen. So instantly you will see the two, um, the two algorithms are running in parallel and each one of them is providing um, its, its accuracy. So you can see here that random forest had highest uh, or higher accuracy than decision tree. And you can explore the, the model information for each of them by literally just clicking on it. So click on this one or that one and then see what happens here. So now we understand what variable importance is. So here is a variable importance graph that you can have and you can see that the density, chlorides and alcohol are the main important variables that decide the quality wine. And it's not just divided by um, the, 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 the column itself, but actually pH, for example, um, this has more um, influence with this specific figure than, than being 3.04 um, um, here. And here you can see your confusion matrix. So you can see the number of true predictions versus the um, wrong predictions. Uh, but this is, this is pretty much good. Uh, model. In, in real life, very, very high accuracy is not realistic. So you, if, if you're a data scientist or if you're dealing with data scientists, you would know that a model that provides 100% accuracy, there's something wrong with that. that. That doesn't happen in real life. So it might be like the, the, the summary here that says that um, um, it's 70% accuracy or something, it might be low for you, but it, it's, it's actually a very good uh, model. And then definitely you can, you can explore the meaning and the explanation of all of these as well uh, on our uh, course. But uh, anyway, uh, let's go back to the models and uh, let's go back to this page and see uh, what we will do after that. So for example, it's now up to you to decide which model you will apply to help you predict um, the, this data set and, and see if it's working and also uh, to predict new uh, data set. So for example, uh, if I go back to the flow here, you will see that that's answering one of the questions uh, earlier. We only have the, the clustering model now, but we've already trained a classification model, but it doesn't appear on on the flow. The moment you deploy it, so if you go to random forest, and which is the one I'm happy to deploy, and then click deploy, now it will appear on the flow. And you can see here that this is the sign of a machine learning model been trained. And you can use um, uh, you can use it to uh, either predict a new data set or even apply that prediction on this on this one as well. So let's pretend that we have a new data set, for example, that you wanted to predict. So for example, let's, let's, for example, add another data set, which is our one, but let's just uh, uh, treat it as a new uh, data set. So if I add this here, And then I will preview and then I will just add this one and then I will call it to score maybe. Oh, it's, it's different, sorry. 
I type two fifth in. Let's score this one. What will, it's very easy, done in very uh, easy steps, which is I want you to score this data with um, with this uh, with this model. So, but let's remove the the column of quality first. So I'm gonna just change that. Mm, test for to score, and I'm gonna just remove a column here, which is this one, the quality. And I will run that. And I think I made a mistake, but hold on. We will see. We will see. So test scored. So now we can see that the model has applied its understanding. And let's scroll all the way here. You will see that by scoring that new data set, it has taken into consideration all those variables. Oh, sorry, the screen is cut. Okay. So you can see here that the variables have been taken into consideration and the predictions have been provided in as um, as um, a probability so you can see here that the probability of this uh, type of wine uh, being uh, of quality six or five or seven these are the probabilities and eventually the final prediction was provided based on uh, the highest uh, probability for each for each one. So it's literally giving you all types of, of information um, by why this was predicted um, in, in this way. So this is um, this is done. Um, we've we've had a, a, a data set for wine and then we've uh, applied clustering. Yes, clustering has identified the two segments in our data set. And we've also applied cl uh, classification technique to understand the patterns, what variables lead to a specific level of quality. We've also applied that and scored new data uh, with this. What I want to share before we go through questions is if you go to learn in our website, like Assuming that you've had the the, the 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 software installed and you've also or you've launched the the cloud uh, version, what, when you go to learn, you will have so many knowledge based uh, stuff. So you have the community here that uh, will help you to ask so many questions and answered by our team and also the users in uh, different enterprise. Um, so this is the community. Just sign in and ask all the questions that you want. And uh, you will see all the error questions that have been answered before. You will have here the knowledge base. This is literally leading you to um, details and, and courses and classes about each of these topics. But if you go to the academy, you have two um, ways to learn. You have the course catalog and you have the learning path and certification. So if you go to this one, uh, this one is ready. You can just finish it now and uh, get certified for a floor designer. It's all free, by the way. And if you feel like it, you can go to machine learning practitioner. There is an entire course uh, about the explanation of machine learning. This is um, this is covering what we've already covered and, and more algorithms. And then you can go ahead and cover even more advanced. So it, it goes with levels. So go ahead and finish all uh, this if you want, and then go back and uh, apply the, 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 uh, the project and build it as we said. There is one more thing that will be very, very helpful for you. If you go to learn again, and if you go to sample projects, you will be taken to a page of projects that we as data team have built. So 
it has so many projects here uh, with different categories. They're all categorized here on the left-hand side. Let's say, for example, that you're interested to see how a project was built. Just click on it and you will have an explanation of the use case here, but you will also be having access to the project itself. So if you click on the project, you will be taken to our uh, environment full of galleries. This is literally a data pool gallery environment that you will have access to the, the projects. You will uh, be able to see the, the data sets. You will be able to click on the recipes and see how it's it's built. Um, you cannot download the projects, but you're, you're, it's fully interactive. And once you have access to one project, go to the homepage here and you will have the all the rest of all the other projects. Go ahead and explore all of them. Uh, they're all explained in details in each wiki page for the project. So each project has a wiki page, which is explaining literally how it's built and why. And the flow uh, is fully interactive. It will tell you exactly uh, what is happening and how the flow is built. And um, you can just um, mimic maybe or try it uh, on your own. So um, and, and everything is free. So that's it from my side now. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and I think we're very good with the timing. So I think we still have like what, um, four minutes? No, not, not four minutes, like less than 10 minutes, but we can, we can take more questions if you guys want. Yeah, definitely. It looks like there's five questions in the Q and A. Hey, I'm no. trying to see where are they because I'm, I'm scrolling maybe in the wrong direction. Can we see the uh, in the Zoom webinar? Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, down the bottom. If you open the Q and A, there should be five that are listed as open. Oh, okay. So, uh, I was looking at the answered ones. So, so <laughs> my brain is not functioning. <laughs> it's been a good session. Good session. So there's five there. Hopefully, you can see them now. Okay, so can DSS use TensorFlow? Yes, the short answer. The explanation is going to be taking a lot of time, but you can go to our documentation page and uh, also in Learn here, you can see the documentation. And this is literally the catalog, like it's a documentation for you. Every single feature, how and why it was built and what type of library is supporting that and how to do that. So just type here whatever you want with apps, variables, notebooks, Python, uh, whatever, and you will find more information. So uh, this is answered. Can features and variables be Booleans only? Yeah, you can, it's based on your use case. So yeah. Uh, does decision tree random forest take into account non-linear relationship between a given predictor and our outcome variable? Does it also take into account interactions between predictors? Yes, that's the idea of it because it's treating, so it's a yes and no questions, but um, it works with, with numerical variable in also a yes or no question. So if you have a numerical variable, for example, um, it will divide the question based on the range of that variable. So if you have a numerical variable, it will just divide it first into, is it bigger than six uh, or, uh, bigger than five or between five and, and 10 and, and so on. And based on the, also the answer, yes and no. So yes, it will take that into consideration. Uh, any plans to release a Windows version of the DDPool platform? I'm not sure what you mean with Windows. Does it, if, you're, if you think it, uh, or if your question is about, is, does it work with Microsoft? Yes, it does, because it's, um, it can work with uh, with the Microsoft uh, Azure and the Microsoft SQL. Um, is it uh, downloadable on a Windows machine? Yeah, because it, it doesn't interfere with with the Windows. It's just when you download it from here, it's just different uh, process. That's it. So if you get started um, and you install, it will give you the uh, the information about which 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 uh, which operating system that you're working with. So yeah, you can have it on on Windows here, and you can see the instructions here. Um, uh, these trainings on your website are free, available just for 14 days. No, the trainings are all free, but this um, this. Um, 
this one, this free trial, this is a cloud-based trial for you to try the platform on the cloud. But this one is free forever. So it's the community edition. This is free forever. Um, does the initial variable in the decision tree mean it's the most important variable? No, it starts with any variable and then divides the, the, the answers, uh, the questions after that. Uh, what you're talking about is the variable importance. And that's decided after the, the decision tree has run. The, the top one on the graph is the most important variable, yes. If the variable importance are equal zero for a variable in the decision tree, then can we remove it? It's up to you to consider it um, redundant and do not include it in the features that are considered as inputs, but it still depends on your use case because, it, it, well, maybe one record is zero or the majority of records are zero, but some records are one or even zero point something. So you need to, it's, it's, it's basically up to your use case. Does the community version of DDA pool make available GPU processing and a large amount of RAM? If you're using a huge data set, this will be using your own um, machine uh, memory. So if you're installing this on your laptop, uh, yes, it will be using your your memory of, of, of your computer. Uh, what is the advantage of running uh, launch on the cloud? Do you suggest it for always? It's based on your business model and based on um, the type of, of organization that you're working on because um, the cloud version uh, is going to be released, uh, not sure when, but, but soon, I hope. Um, but it's, it's normally targeting not huge organizations. So our big clients, such as maybe Unilever, um, Pfizer, uh, no, they don't, they don't, of course, they don't use the cloud uh, version. The, the, the platform is installed on their premises, sits on top of their data sets, and they leverage their own engines and their own uh, database uh, capabilities. Uh, so yeah, it depends on the, the your business model and your needs and the number of, of team members who are going to be using it and also the, the, the data uh, sets that you are going to be uh, using. So yeah, no more questions. <laughs> I, I don't have any questions on unless you guys can see any more questions. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. That was perfect. You, you've answered 31 questions uh, and delivered a two hour workshop. Uh, Noah, so we're very, very grateful. And uh, you guys at home uh, that have been watching, if you don't mind, just drop a little thank you in the chat. Uh, it's really nice. Obviously, if we're in a live environment, uh, it's nice to get a round of applause. So here's a, a virtual round of applause for you, uh, Noah. You. No, honestly, I'm hoping that everyone has enjoyed the session. Uh, it, 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 it's fun to keep learning uh, data science. I haven't known everything that I have communicated today in, in a few days. It was just, it took me years, but it took years of passion rather than just uh, um, and just difficulty. There is nothing difficult. It's just if you're passionate about something, you will keep learning and you will get better every time uh, you you practice. Um, it takes practice and the download the platform. Honestly, is free. It's it's actually the reason I joined uh, DDA Pool in the first place. So go ahead, sign up to the academy. Um, explore. I don't know everything. I just know what I've communicated today. But I hope that you guys found it useful. It was really, really good. And the, the comments are flying in there, actually. And uh, talking about passion, we, we had nearly 300 people come and join you for lunch. Uh, so it's nice when people are giving up their time to learn. Uh, and as I say, massive thank you to you for giving up your time. Uh, and thank you to uh, Daytriku for being such awesome partners uh, for us. Uh, yeah. We really do appreciate it. And uh, I know we've got actually further plans with you guys in December. Uh, yeah. And I think going into next year, we'll be doing some more live events, which I'm sure we're all uh, very much looking forward to as well. So yeah. thank uh, you so much, guys. Uh, I'm you. available on LinkedIn. So just go ahead and connect with me. And uh, if you have any questions about the platform, you sign up to the community and you will have one of us uh, answering you, definitely. Perfect. So I'll draw things to a close then. Thank you guys for uh, joining us from home as well. Uh, everyone stay safe. And uh, yeah, we'll be back soon with some more events through the rest of November. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, see you soon. Bye bye.